to me, the biggest factor that I came across in all researching Central Florida history is that dates really matter. A lot of time when you're reading old histories, they'll say so-and-so did such-and-such, but when you really dig into it, you find out either so-and-so wasn't born yet or such-and-such happened much later than the, the writer thought. So much of Orlando and Central Florida's history was handed down orally <clears throat> that it wasn't until many years later that that it got to the point where you could start proving or disproving that. So therefore, <clears throat> you're gonna see a lot of what I show here as L. L in this particular case, and anytime you see this L, it represents the legend, and I'll get to that. The legend of Orlando Rees is a date of September 1835. So in 114 years after the legend of Orlando Rees supposedly occurred, E.H. Gore, a nephew of old-timer Malin Gore, published From Florida Sand to the City Beautiful. In that book, he detailed the story one story of Orlando Rees. <clears throat> he was not the original, but he did detail certain aspects of it. But he also told of other versions as to how Orlando was named. <clears throat> one particular legend was that Orlando was named by a ill friend of James G. Spear, one of the first pioneers in the area, and that friend supposedly got sick and died, and so James Spear named for him. <clears throat> Another particular version was that it was named for Orlando Rees, I mean Orlando, the character in the Shakespeare play, As You Like It. Very old play. In the 1850s, 60s, 70s, when we didn't have TVs, <clears throat> that particular play roamed the countryside. It was, uh, it was put on often all throughout the country. Another version was that it was named for the first postmaster of Orlando, who was John R. Worthington. So some say that he came up with the name Orlando. And then E.H. Gore saw, talked about the soldier Orlando Reeves that was killed at Lake Eola by Indians. There is a fifth version that Gore did not discuss, but the county of Volusia claims that Orlando was named for its, one of its plantation owners who was Orlando Reese, R-E-E-S. So there was various versions of exactly how Orlando got named. The problem is, <clears throat> E.H. Gore said, the one that one out is the story of Orlando Rees. Now, without, without giving out my birth date exactly, um, I was born not too terribly off of the date of the publication of the E.H. Gore and the next book that I'm going to tell you about, Keena Fries' book. I was in that range, and I grew up, and cowboy and Indian stories were pretty popular at the time. I remember many a time uh, my playing cowboys and Indians myself. So it's pretty easy to understand that maybe this particular version did win out. <clears throat> Kena Fries <clears throat> was the daughter of one of Orange County's very first surveyors. She um, wrote a book as well, and she named her book Orlando in the long, long ago. She wrote her book 103 years after the legend. It was published <clears throat> in 1938, and in her book is the most colorful version of Orlando Rees. Indians snuck up, floated up on logs in Lake Eola in the dead of night. All the soldiers were sleeping but one, Orlando Rees. 
And all of a sudden, he saw the logs were not really logs. They were Indians, but just as he spotted them and called out their, that the Indians were coming, they shot and killed him with a dozen poison arrows. And because of that, they chased those Indians all the way to Huey Bay, where they finally caught up with them. She doesn't say what they did with them, but then they came back, got the body of Orlando Reeves, and they buried him on the lake shore of Lake Eola. Like I said, she presented one of the most colorful versions of, of anybody ever writing about it. One year after she published her book in 1938, <clears throat> The students of Cherokee High, Junior High, erected this monument in Lake Eola. Make it a little bit easier. The monument says that Orlando Rees was killed <clears throat> by Indians on the Lake Eola and that the town of Orlando was named in his honor. <clears throat> Naturally, anybody coming to Orlando and walking, taking a nice casually stroll around Lake Eola is going to see this monument and assume that this is really the truth. So over the many, many years, I remember the first time I came to Lake Eola back in the 70s, and I walked around, and I, I thought, all right, I guess that's the way it was. If you asked anybody, they'd always say, well, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of different versions. <clears throat> 88 years after the legend supposedly took place, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Griffin, a longtime resident of the city of Orlando, addressed the Ladies Sororis Club. <clears throat> he was asked to present and tell the history of Orlando, so he and his wife <clears throat> prepared a detailed um, lecture about the city, a lot about it, but also how Orlando got named. <clears throat> now we're getting closer and closer to the stores, but we're still in 1923. So this is what Samuel Griffin had said to the ladies. <clears throat> he says, I spoke with John Otto Fries, and John Otto Fries told me the story about the Indian killing at Lake Eola. Now, John Otto Fries arrived in Central Florida on Christmas Eve of, nine, of 1871. The following day, he took a buckboard to the town of Orlando, stayed one day, looked it over, and walked back to Mellonville because the buggy took too long. And then he returned to become a surveyor. So he was living in the Central Florida area around the mid-1870s. <clears throat> So Sam said the next thing he did is he talked to Samuel A. Robinson. Now, Samuel A. Robinson is also a very well-known surveyor um, for the county. And he said Sam Robinson told him the story that was passed to him from J the son of James G. Spears that says, no, that's not true. Orlando was named for the friend of, our, uh, of uh, James G. Spear. He turned ill. He was taking care of him, and he died, and that's how Orlando got named. James G. Spear named it. So Sam says, now next I went to Benjamin Robinson. Now Benjamin Robinson is not related to Sam. Sam's from Michigan. Benjamin was from Alabama. But Benjamin Robinson was a <clears throat> very long, well-established city individual as well. For a long time, he uh, was the uh, clerk of court. He also served as mayor. <clears throat> he was married into the William Randolph family. He had come in 1874, 75 area. And he says, neither of these are true. Sam Griffin said he emphatically said that Orlando was named for a character in Shakespeare's play, As You Like It. He said James G. Spear was, loved Shakespeare. Or Jane, and that's how it, that town got named. Sam Griffin concluded his talk by saying, I dared not ask another how Orlando got its name. 
I'm going to get back to the, this photo was taken 40 years after the legend. It was shot by Stanley J. Morrow, who was a famous photographer. Morrow was the first photographer to take pictures at Custer's Last Stand. And he came and lived here in Orlando for a short time. And this is a photo of Lake Eola, and I'm going to get back to this picture in just a little while. But this is 40 years after the legend. At that particular time, <clears throat> all three individuals who thought they knew how Orlando was named were in Orlando. Both Robinsons uh, and John Freeze were all three living right here in Orlando. And in 1875, just before this, a little bit before this picture was taken, there assembled all of the landowners anywhere within a mile of the city of Orlando. I'm going to pass around my first handout. You can kind of glance at it as I'm talking. What you're going to see is these are the actual, oh, let me get them started. What you're looking at here is, the, is a copy of the actual Articles of Incorporation for the town of Orlando. They were handwritten in August 1875. And the couple of interesting notes on here is that none of the four gentlemen that I mentioned, John Fries, Sam Robinson, Ben Robinson, James G. Spears, not, none of them were listed as attending the first organization of Orlando. Now, I should point out here that it, that was not the start of Orlando. It was the incorporation of Orlando. One of the most interesting things to me in this article of incorporation, and I've circled the name, is the name R.W. Broome, B-R-O-O-M-E. Broome was not a landowner. He owned no property in Orange County. He actually was a resident of Lake City. Robert Broom was elected and served as the chairman of the incorporation meeting of the city of Orlando. You will also see the name J.R. Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. That man did not yet own property in Orange County, but he served as secretary. The two individuals who organized the meeting and set up the corporate charter and brought these landowners together were not residents of Orange County. An interesting note, which I'll get to a little later. Broom, B-R-O-O-M-E, a name to remember. This is the front page of the document, four-page document that is being passed around right now. And as I said, none of these names appear as being at that meeting. Twenty-two years after the legend took place, <clears throat> the Samuel A. Robinson shows up as being the surveyor of the first town of Orlando, 417 feet by 417 feet, four acres in size. He was the actually the individual who laid it out. <clears throat> but backing up even further, 11 years after the legend supposedly to occurred is the very first survey of the land upon which we're sitting in right now this second. I'm gonna move away from the mic so I can show you one.
that particular survey was done in 1846, nine years before the actual town of Orlando that Sam Robinson drew in 1880. The actual town that was formed in 1857 is right there on that spot. Going back to the date of the legend, this is where we have to start if we're ever going to try and find out if Orlando Rees' legend is really true. This is a war map that was drawn by the U.S. Army. The war map is dated 1835-1837. It has one particular interesting feature. The route of General Jessup from Ocala, which was then Fort King, to Lake Toho Balaka. <clears throat> That's the route he took in 1837. The circled area that I have in red is the area where Orlando and most all of Orange County is today. And as of 1837, there is not one path, not one indication that the Army ever was in this particular region prior to 1837. There was a gentleman, a young boy named Kinsley Dalton, Kinsley H. Dalton. Kinsley, this is his reinterment paper for his, the body that was relocated from the d place where he was killed and reburied. <clears throat> and as you can see, he was killed August 11th, 1835. The problem is that Kinsley Dalton was killed going from Tampa to Ocala on the same route that the Dade Massacre took place in December 1835. How do we know this information is accurate? One thing they didn't realize when they were writing histories in the 1920s and the 1930s and the 1950s is that when the soldiers were killed, it just the, the army just didn't go off and leave them. The Army actually kept very accurate records of everybody that got the typhoid fever, that got wounded, or that was killed. So you can look over these a little bit closer. I'm, I'm passing around a document that shows this particular paper and also the Dalton death certificate from the military. If you were looking at this in a book, you're going to see it on this paper because this is really one long, wide ledger. I had to break it in two so that you could actually see it. But what this ledger says here is it shows where Kinsley H. Dalton was attacked by Indians and killed while running express, August 11th, 1835. So it's an important starting point because all of the military information that you will find references, or at least that I was able to find, references the fact that the killing of Kinsley H. Dalton was one of the very first incidents that really kicked off the Second Seminole Indian War. But in November of 1836, I'm sure you've probably all heard about this, William Maitland was serving in the U.S. Army, and he was wounded at the Battle of Wahoo Swamp. I don't know if any of you have been to Wahoo Swamp. I have. It's a little bit south of Wildwood on the west side. It still exists today. It is still sitting in mostly in water. It is about the most horrendous place you could imagine. I got out of my car to photograph it <clears throat> for about three or four minutes until I got attacked by some of the largest mosquitoes I had ever seen. I got back in my car and took pictures from inside the car. 
William Mayton was injured at Wahoo Swamp, <clears throat> and so they sent him home. By the time he got to South Carolina, he was in so much pain and misery, he drowned himself. In December of 1836, a month after Maitland was wounded, the U.S. military decided it had to come down to St. John's in order to cut a line between the plantations around Spring Grove which, and New Smyrna and all that, and where the, they thought the Indians were living, which was down in uh, the South Florida. So they came and set up a camp on Lake Monroe and called it Camp Monroe. That was December. The following February, the Indians attacked Camp Monroe. Charles Mellon was killed in that attack, and they immediately renamed a fort, Fort Mellon. In um, October 1838, U.S. papers in the north show where the military sent down orders for soldiers to leave Camp Monroe, or Fort Mellon, and march south inland, October 1838. When they reached Maitland, they set up a supply camp, and there at Maitland, they called it Fort Maitland in honor of the soldier who had killed himself from his injuries. They continued on until they got to the Three Lakes about five miles. Of interest is that when they were marching, they would have marched right alongside this library in between here and the History Center was the first road to Gatlin. <clears throat> when they reached Gatlin, when they reached the lakes there, they set up a fortress there and they named it for John Slade Gatlin, a doctor who was killed in the Dade Massacre in 1835. Now there's a consistency here that needs to be pointed out. Remember, the myth or the legend is that Orlando Rees was killed right here in Lake Eola in September 1835 under a full moon. I'm sorry, I have to confess, I haven't researched to see if there was a full moon in September of 1835, but I have done this. A year and a half later, when a soldier was killed at, at Lake Monroe, they named a fortress after him. When they reached Maitland, they named a fortress there after him, after a, a, a dead soldier. And when they reached Gatlin, they named that fortress after a deceased soldier. Three different fortresses that have one common ingredient. Each one was named for the soldier's last name. If they would have called Fort Gatlin Fort John, no one would have known who, Fort, who it was named for. There was no Fort Reeves and there was no Fort Orlando. So this kind of cast a little doubt over the legend of Orlando Reeves. There's one other thing that has to be considered, and this takes us back to the opening photo. The three pyramids, the three pyramids at National Cemetery in St. Augustine. The warrior's ethos is where you don't leave any soldier behind. After the Seminole Indian War, the army went back and dug up and removed 1,468 deceased soldiers. They moved them all to St. Augustine, and all of them are buried under these three pyramids. There is no Orlando Rees buried at National Cemetery in St. Augustine. Which raises the question, if it is an Orlando Rees, then who? This takes us back to Volusia County. 
prior to the legend date, in 1832, the well-known John James Audubon, a man who painted pictures of birds from all over the world, I believe, he traveled down the St. John's and made it as far as Spring Garden, a place you can visit today if you go out to Leon Spring State Park because that's where Spring Garden is. John James Audubon kept the diary, and in his diary he says on January 6, 1832, that he arrived at the plantation of Colonel Orlando S. Reese, R-E-E-S. Many years later, I myself arrived at the grave of Colonel Orlando S. Reese. It was many years later. That's why it's in color. <clears throat> this is in Stateburg, South Carolina. Indeed, Orlando S. Reese was a very prominent individual in South Carolina. He inherited Spring Garden from the Williams family, which is a whole other story we won't go into right now. The site of Spring Garden was raided as one of the 16 plantations in December of 1835 that were burned down to the ground by Indian attacks. Another was in New Smyrna Beach, which was where Jane Murray lived. If you haven't read about Jane Murray, she was my very first Women's History Month post this month. She was probably among, she was one of the first three females to ever settle in what was then Orange County, and she actually had a 600-acre plantation with her mother. You see, I'm a father of three daughters, and I know what women can do, so um, that's, that's why I like to write about the accomplishments of women as well. The problem with Orlando Reese as being why the town was named, he may have been involved to some degree, but he wasn't the sole factor. One of the things that struck me most about Orlando is that it was named for a person's first name. Why? It kept haunting me. Why did they name the town for somebody's first name when you wouldn't know who that person was necessarily? And that's what we're going to get to. That clue begins with a young eight-year-old boy by the name of Robert F. Roper. I'm going to try and get through this tongue twister as best as I can. I'll correct myself if I have to. But Robert F. Roper wrote in 1927 about his first ever visit to the village of Orlando that occurred in April 1861. I personally decided I needed to test his memory because in his, mem in his notes he talked about his father coming on a on an ox-drawn wagon with his father. It took him the greater part of a, after, of a day to get here from Oakland, where his father had a plantation that he had just purchased a year before. And along the way, they met a mail carrier and learned that Fort Sumter had been attacked. Sure enough, Fort Sumter was attacked in April of 1861. So he's, he then talked about reaching Orlando and finding a town with two stores, two log stores. One was already closed, and the other store was run by a Henry Roberson. So, <clears throat> again, Robert Ro Roper talked about coming to the store of Henry Roberson. He also said that his father bought out the goods of the store that was run by Henry Roberson. And I thought, so why could that possibly be true? This is my next handout. You can look at this quickly. This is a bill of sale. What you're going to be looking at is the bill of sale for $505 that William C. Roper paid to B.B. Reams for the contents of a store and 
Um, if you ever want to know, I can tell you how to reach it if you want to find out how much he paid for everything. He bought li silk, linens, um, blankets, a little bit of everything. So you might wonder, well, how would he remember that in such detail? <clears throat> and why was the bill of sale made out to B.B. Reams? The answer is quite simple. <clears throat> Henry Roberson was in business with Bartlett B. Reams. <clears throat> there is actually documents filed at the city, or the uh, Orange County, that show the business name Reams and Roberson. They occupied lot one of the four acre town of Orlando. That would be in the corner of this library right up here. On, um, right around the corner here would be lot one of the town of Orlando. It was on this side of the old trail. <clears throat> Henry Roberson had married himself a little 15 year old girl, young girl. And her name was Catherine Reams. She was the daughter of Bartlett B. Reams, who had gone into business when he arrived here in Orlando. So I'm doing pretty good so far. We have Rober, Roper coming down with Reams and Roberson, and now we're back to the name Bartlett Reams. For the longest time, many historians thought Bartlett Reams lived in Winter Garden, Oakland area, where William C. Roper lived. And he did. He did when, after William came here and bought out his goods, because what happened in April of 1861, when the Civil War was breaking out, was the little bitty village of Orlando was basically shut down. It was abandoned. And so Henry Roperson, the, the young business partner, he went off to war. Catherine and her father, Bartlett, went with William C. and, and uh, Robert back to Oakland. And that's where they lived during the Civil War, and they stayed there after the Civil War. For a brief moment in time, Bartlett Reams lived right here, owned property, not only this piece of property, but a piece of an adjacent parcel. And I hate to do this, I got another one. What you're gonna see next is the land, the parcel that Reams sold. Reams sold the goods to Roper, but he sold the parcel to a mystery lady that I have been searching for for a decade now and I've yet to find, but I know where she lived, I just don't know what she was ever doing here. But her name was Carolyn, um, this is awful, Matthews I believe it was, a lady from uh, Georgia. Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I just re forgot her name because she wasn't going to be part of this anyway. But anyway, Colbert, C-O-L-B-E-R-T, that's her name. Her name was Colbert. <clears throat> but Bartlett sold that piece of land that you're going to be looking at. Get up here. This document here is for this piece of property. Don't get too confused by the, I'll show you exactly where the property is. But this is the parcel. The important thing is, is it's really three different parcels. The last parcel being three quarters of an acre. That was lot one right here in the corner. Remember the survey I said, I told you about that was done in 1846. The two parcels that Reams, Bartlett Reams sold is this. Orlando because war is coming and I'm going over and live with my brother-in-law William C. Roper I'm going to sell off my land this property was sold so what you might say the plot thickens years a short time later that was in 1861 as I said a little early, earlier in 1871 
a young Swedish surveyor by the name of John Otto Fries came to Orlando for the very first time. An interesting side note, because I, want, I know you want to be bored to death, but later he brought his wife and daughters, two daughters over, and they arrived in New York on the SS Orlando. Just a side note. <clears throat> he had a special affinity for Orlando. But he later drew a sketch of how he remembered Orlando when he came in the 1870s. This was his sketch. The sketch was included in his daughter's 1938 book, Orlando of Long, Long Ago. In this particular case, I want to draw attention to one note that he made, which kind of caught me off surprise, and that is he drew Old Orange Grove. That was kind of unusual in 1870 because the oranges hasn't really made it to Central Florida yet. Most people writing in the 1870s said that they were growing oranges along the St. John's. But when Harney arrived in 1869, he said almost nobody grew oranges south of Lake Monroe yet. But some orange trees had been planted as early as 1860. Those orange trees were later photographed by the photo I showed you a little earlier in 1887. Now you know what it had done when in my post it said, do you see it? I didn't see it at first, but this was a picture of 1887 of humongous orange trees, humongous trees that would have taken quite a while to have grown by 1887. This was the, or, uh, the grove of Bartlett B. Reams on the land that you saw that he had sold to Colbert. After the Civil War, Reconstruction period, by the end of the eight, nine, 1860s, by the end of that decade, almost nobody knew who owned what. That's why it was, became so difficult to reconstruct history. So much had been lost. This is the map that Sam Robinson drew of Orlando. And I just wanted to show you the two stores, lot one, which is, at the, as I said, at the corner of the library here, inside the library. The library actually sits on lot one over here in this corner. It was owned by Bartlett Reams and Henry Roberson. The other lot 10 is that corner right there across the street, across Central, and that was the Meisel store. That was lot one. They were the only two stores, and they were on Main Street of Orlando, but it was also called the Mellonville Road, which came right down alongside the library here. As I said, we have a Roper, Reams and Roberson, for the village of Orlando, in 1859 to 1861. I also mentioned the fact that Henry Roberson had gone off to war and never came back. He died a prisoner at Fort Delaware. His wife, Catherine, had one child, Henry Roper Jr., and she was living over on Oakland Plantation. When her husband, first husband died, after the war, she remarried. She remarried a gentleman by the name of Mark Rees. Mark Rees was the son of Roland Rees, who came in the early, or in the 18, or around 1870, I believe, from North Florida. He lived next door to James G. Spear out in Oakland, and they were very, very good friends. <clears throat> By 1874, Catherine Rees had to come back to Orlando long enough to close off the property, sign off on property, that had been her first husband, Roberson's property. So she signed those documents as Catherine Rees associating the name Reeves with Lake Eola. But beyond, because Catherine 
Roberson, when she was married to Henry Roberson, lived on a par 160 acres that fronted Lake Lucerne, as did James P. Huey on a lake that before it was became Lake Lucerne was known as Huey Bay. The name Reeves all of a sudden is associated with at least two of the locations about Orlando Reeves. <clears throat> so a, a soldier was killed in 1835 by Indians. His name was Kinsley Dalton. The Reeves name can indeed be tied to Lake Eola. And again, if not Orlando Reeves, then who? Seven years, going back to seven years after the legend date, 1846, a young man by the name of Benjamin F. Whitner, Jr. came down the Old Forts Trail, walked right past the library here, and his job was to do surveying. His surveying started just beyond the town of Orlando here. Over the next six years, Benjamin Whitner surveyed 540 square miles of South Orange County. Everything, everything in Fort Gatlin down to Kissimmee City, all the way over to Disney World, <clears throat> all of this land back to almost to the Orlando International Airport was surveyed by this one individual, Benjamin F. Whitner, one of the most least recognized individuals in the annals of Central Florida history. Benjamin Whitner was the son of Elizabeth Ann Spann, S-P-A-N-N, a very prominent South Carolina family. He was the grandfather of James G. Spann III. Um, James G. Spann can be tied back to Stateburg, where Orlando Reese died, and he can also, for a term, or his family is still widely known on the island that separates Augusta and the South Carolina. There's an island right there, and his family lived on that island, and I think there's a museum, an old house or something that is still known by this date to the Spann family. Orlando S. Reese, on the other hand, was the son of Mary Reese. At this point, rather than passing this out, I'd just like to read one sentence, one paragraph, short paragraph from my book, First, Lord, First Road to Orlando. The year John James Audubon had visited the Spring Garden, Mary Reese, the mother of Orlando Savage Reese, died at Stateburg, South Carolina. Mary survived Orlando's father, William Reese, and so she left most of her estate, quote, to my sons, Orlando Savage Reese and James G. Spann. Oh, I should have gotten all oh, out of that. <laughs> so, what does all this mean? <clears throat> I'm going to get to there, but I got to go one other route first. Almost there. The William Shakespeare play was l released in the early 1600s, and it is a play in which a gentleman by the name of Orlando was the son of a deceased fa father named Roland. <clears throat> now, Roland died, made his, the eldest son, um, administrator and the eldest son cheated Orlando out of all, everything he had so Orlando had to abandon his home and he ran to the forest of Arden where he met his uh, princess. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the princess part. Sometimes it seems life imitates art. In real life, if you were to go to Williamsburg, Virginia, which I have done and I've walked in steps and it kind of gives you a little chills, there's a huge church 
that was that dates back to the days when Reverend Roland Jones was the reverend at the church. He was an immigrant. He came to America in 1667. He married. His first wife died after having a few children. He remarried. <clears throat> and his new wife, Anne, had a, one child, and she named that son Orlando. Now, I would imagine you could say she probably had seen the play, thought, hey, his father's Roland, why not? I'm going to name my son Orlando. What does it have any of this to do? As I show you throughout First Road to Orlando, Roland Jones, the immigrant, had a son Orlando. Orlando married a lady by the name of Martha Jones. They had a child, a girl, who became, who married, and let me think how this goes, get it straight here. Their daughter was Martha Washington. Orlando Jones, as you can find out in Williamsburg, Virginia, is the great-great-grandfather of Martha Washington, the first first lady of this nation. They also had a son named Lane. Lane married and had a son, and he named his son Orlando. That Orlando lived in the area around Thomas Jefferson. And that Orlando used his, he had a very large plantation. And during the American Revolution, he volunteered the use of his plantation for prisoners of war, English prisoners of war. So they lived on his plantation. And when became rather a prominent American patriot because of that. They also had a daughter. Her daughter was, their daughter was Frances Jones. She married a man by the name of John Ellington, and they moved to South Carolina. They had 13 children. Of the last three girls, there was something going on in, in literature because their last three daughters were named Parthenia, Isaphina, and Car Carolina Justifiva, or something like that. The second one's more important. After the death of John Ellington, the daughter, the father of, of um, Isaphina, <clears throat> the mother remarried to William H. Caldwell. They left Abbeville, South Carolina, and they moved to Talladega, Alabama. That couple had one child, and that child was named Benjamin F. Caldwell. Ah, I see the arms going out. So, Benjamin F. Caldwell and Isaphina C. Ellington were half-siblings. The problem was, Isaphina had a direct lineage to Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Benjamin had no such lineage. But when his father died... He was left with this piece of land way down in Orange County, Florida, that he had no idea what to do with. There are actually two letters that I mentioned in First Road to Orlando that Benjamin wrote. He wrote the first one in January of 1858 when he said, I finally arrived here at um, Oakland, out there, Lake Apopka. And the next letter was written 12 months later in December when he says, all right, I'm in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm on, way to, on my way to Texas. Benjamin was the administrator of his father's estate. He was supposed to be homesteading land because if you know how Florida homestead land works, you had to live on it for five years. Benjamin had this 120 acres right here that he wasn't living on. Meanwhile, his half-sister, Isaphina, she was married to James G. Spear. She was this first wife. You won't find her in history. And to some degree, I can understand. Isaphina and James, they sold, I don't know how, am I doing all right on time? A few more minutes, all right? All right. So Isaphina and James sold all their property in Orange County, and they went to Dunedin, Dunedin down on the coast. The property in Oakland that they sold, they sold to a man 
by the name of Jackson. Well, when they're down in Dunedin, Isaphina died. That was 1867. James G. Spear came back, and he married the, da the daughter after the husband and wife, Jacksons, had died. He married their daughter, and he moved back onto the land that his first wife owned. So there might have been some reason why the second wife didn't want to have a whole lot of historical information passed down on them. How do we know some of this? You probably all have seen this where Benjamin, the donor, Benjamin F. Caldwell had donated. Maybe you haven't seen this one, Village of Orlando, where Betty H. Caldwell and William H. Caldwell filed a document gifting some property over to their daughter, Isafina G. Spear. There's the connection. So, the question, is Orlando Reeves real or myth? There is absolutely nothing that I have been able to find in a decade of research that Orlando Reeves ever existed. But I have often heard the t story about starting a secret at one end of the t crowd and have them going around and see what that se how that secret sounds by the time it's at the other end. All of this kind of converged over many, many years. And so that's, I hope I gave you some idea. I, is this exactly true? Everything I've told you is fact. Everything I have told you tonight, I can back up. Can I back up that Orlando was actually named? I believe Orlando was named the first name because it was a series. There was more than one Orlando. There was a family of the Spans, the Whitners, and to some extent the Whit uh, the, well Whitner Span <clears throat> and uh, Isafina's Ellington family. All of them wanted to establish something that would be lasting, that would be a memorial to their Orlando uh, ancestry. And the best way to do that is to establish a county seat because county seats last. You can name, there are 150 towns in 1880 Orange County that are today ghost towns. But Orlando, the town that it most often has been said should never have existed because it didn't have a river, it didn't have a railroad, it had one old 25 mile dirt path to it, should have never lasted, but it did because it was the county seat. And so my feeling is that unfortunately Orlando Reese. Reeves is a myth.